I'm Eric Anderson. Tonight on KPBS Evening Edition, as residents of Newtown, Connecticut mourn, the nation debates solutions for gun violence. And California's Attorney General shows how the state is trying to keep guns out of the hands of the mentally ill. And I'm Peggy Pico. Also ahead, we take an in-depth look at local laws and services for the mentally ill. Then we talk with San Diego County's Registrar of Voters about her legacy and who's taking her place. And we'll tell you about a veteran from San Diego who's rising above her own trauma to help other women veterans. KPBS Evening Edition starts now. KPBS Evening Edition is made possible by Joan and Irwin Jacobs and by Good evening. Thanks for joining us. Dwayne Brown is off tonight. Students went back to school today in Newtown, Connecticut, some escorted by parents, others taking the bus. They returned to class for the first time since Friday's deadly shooting at Sandy Hook Elementary. That school remains closed. And today, two more young victims were laid to rest while the nation focused on the question of how to stop such tragedies. Much of the talk focused on gun control. The White House says President Obama is actively supportive of efforts to reinstate an assault weapons ban. California Senator Dianne Feinstein already said she would introduce legislation to bring it back. The president has pledged to address gun violence in the coming weeks, but the White House says gun control is not the only solution to mass shootings. It calls not only for re-examining our gun laws and how well we enforce them, but also for engaging mental health professionals, law enforcement officials, educators, parents, and communities to find uh, those solutions. And while, uh, as I said, there's no one answer to this problem, uh, it is clear that we cannot once again retreat to our separate corners and to our stale talking points uh, because that inevitably leads to an impasse. Worries about new gun restrictions have led to an increase in sales of the AR-15. That's the same weapon used last week to kill 20 children and six adults at Sandy Hook Elementary School. The increase is happening nationwide, including here in San Diego. One local gun shop told us sales have already been going up after President Obama's re-election. Today, the National Rifle Association broke its silence for the first time since Friday's shootings. The group says it stayed quiet out of respect for the families and to allow time for a full investigation. A written, written statement uh, says that the NRA is prepared to offer meaningful contributions to help make sure this never happens again. NRA leaders plan a news conference on Friday to answer questions. California's largest in the nation teacher's pension fund is reviewing all its firearm holdings after finding one of the companies it invests in is linked to the gun used in last week's shooting. The California State Teachers Retirement System says it's making sure its investments comply with its social and ethical standards. CalSTRS put $600 million into the gunmaker's parent company, Cerebrus Capital Management. In the meantime, Cerebrus says it is selling its stake in the gun company. Across California, more than 2,000 guns were seized this year from people who weren't supposed to have them, including people who are mentally ill and those who have active restraining orders. They were tracked through a special database. State Attorney General Kamala Harris says California is the first and only state in the nation with an automated system for tracking gun owners who might fall into a prohibited status. Laura's Law is a little-known California law that allows court-ordered outpatient treatment for those with a history of violent mental illness. But as Peggy Pico explains, San Diego has opted out of the program in lieu of something else. There is no confirmation that the shooter at Sandy Hook Elementary School had a mental illness, but the tragedy in Connecticut has once again sparked a discussion about diagnosis, treatment, and services for the mentally ill. Joining me to talk about mental health laws and programs in San Diego are my guests, Piedad Garcia with San Diego County Behavioral Health and Dr. Michael Plopper, Chief Medical Officer of Sharp Behavioral Health Services. Thank you both for joining me. Dr. Plopper, 10 years ago, California passed Laura's Law 
uh, for people with mental illness, I believe, who are in danger of hurting themselves or others. What is that law? Well, this was a law that was uh, passed, as you mentioned, in the state of California uh, in the early 2000s, which the purpose was to provide for assisted outpatient treatment for uh, people with serious mental illness who have been demonstrated to uh, have issues with noncompliance with treatment and have had a potential for uh, harm to self or others. Uh, it can be implemented in each of the counties uh, in California, so each county has the choice of implementing this law or not. Only two counties have done so. San Diego is not one, and, and we'll get to that in just a moment. But how is this uh, Laura's Law different than, let's say, the 72-hour uh, hold, which is available right now? A 72-hour hold is implemented in a psychiatric facility, uh, or at, a person can be taken by the police uh, to initiate a 72-hour hold in a psychiatric facility. The difference is with Laura's Law, this is outpatient treatment. This is mandated outpatient treatment by court order. Uh, does not force medication, but at the same time does uh, 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 cause a person to get into treatment uh, who may have a potential for harm to self or others. A mandatory treatment on that one. Now, right. Piedad, the county's mental health board advised the county board of supervisors to enact Laura's Law last year, but uh, you, it was declined. How come? Uh, there were a number of reasons, and certainly uh, one associated with uh, the stakeholder process. We thought that a balanced uh, approach would be to have a participatory uh, model of service where the participant would not be um, coerced or um, forced for, uh, to treatment. Um, the cost associated with it in terms of the service, uh, the court uh, services, the probation services, PD services, all of that uh, cost was also taken into consideration and of course uh, the whole area of uh, the civil liberties and the, and the due process for individuals. Let's talk about the pilot program that San Diego is uh, trying out instead. Uh, what is the name of it and in, in a nutshell what does it do? It's called the in in-home outreach team or the IHOT program and basically what uh, the program is about is uh, a team of uh, peer specialists and family coaches and case managers going to the home of the individual and the intent is to engage that individual into uh, services and by frequent visits and working with the family and working with the participant assess what the needs are in terms of their mental health or other needs and link them to services in the community. And that's a voluntary service right Correct. now, about 127 people in that? Actually, there's close to about 300 clients no. or participants have uh, been referred. 127 have been outreached and engaged into the program. Okay, um, Dr. Plepper, what legal rights, this is a voluntary program here in San Diego, what legal rights do uh, adults and children have when it comes to mandatory medical treatment, involuntary medical treatment, and or <coughs> taking medication? Well, specifically psychiatric uh, treatment, uh, people have the right to refuse medication, have the right to uh, refuse hospitalization unless they meet criteria under the LPS Act of being an immediate danger to self, others, or are gravely disabled. So they can be admitted to a hospital for 72 hours, then can be placed on a 14-day hold uh, beyond that, and then sometimes if they're gravely disabled, that is unable to provide food, clothing, and shelter for themselves, uh, may meet criteria for conservatorship. Uh, people uh, can't refuse that at that point if they make these criteria, conservatorship has been applied for, and then uh, Superior Court judges determined that a conservatorship should be enacted. What uh, programs, uh, first of all, do you think this in-home or IHOT program here um, is helpful, and, and I'll finish this question with, or other programs here in sort of preventing uh, this sort of violent act uh, that we just saw on Friday and many others that we'd seen in the last uh, few months. Do we have programs in place or what would you like to see in place? Well, I would like to see Laura's Law enacted in this county because I believe we are missing certain persons who have serious mental illness, have no insight into their illness and are refusing treatment and could represent a danger to themselves or other people. The IHOT program is an excellent program. It fulfills a need in the community, but I don't think it gets to those people who uh, perhaps uh, most need the treatment and are most likely to refuse treatment.
Okay, and Piedad, uh, last question here. What should someone who's watching this at home do if they suspect that either their family member or friend is a danger to themselves or a danger to others? What can they do here in San Diego? I think when the, when the uh, danger is imminent, they certainly can call uh, 911 and they will connect to the psychiatric emergency response team or the PERT team that will go into the home and assess the situation and evaluate the individual for hospitalization. Which is a police officer and a psychiatric Correct. expert. Well, we are out of time. Thank you both for talking with us. Now, anybody in San Diego can reach County Mental Health Services 24 hours a day, seven days a week, by calling toll-free the number on your screen. That's 888-724-7240. That's 888-724-7240. Or then go to our website for more services, KPB. With just two weeks left to avoid the fiscal cliff, House Speaker John Boehner has unveiled Plan B, a deal to cancel tax increases for everyone earning less than a million dollars a year. Anyone earning more than a million a year would pay more. But Plan B does not stop automatic across-the-board spending cuts. The White House is rejecting it, and House Republicans are opposed to it as well. In the meantime, House and Senate negotiators have agreed on a $633 billion defense bill. It includes a 1.7 percent pay raise for military personnel and some leeway for the Pentagon to develop alternative fuels. San Diego now has a law aimed at keeping foreclosed homes from falling into disrepair. It's the first law to be signed by Mayor Bob Filner. KPBS Metro reporter Katie Orr joins us now from the News Center. Katie, what does the new city law require? Well, the Property Value Protection Ordinance, as it's called, requires the title holders of foreclosed homes, which are generally banks, to register with the city. That way, code enforcement officers know whom to contact if the property is not properly maintained. Title holders can be fined if they fail to register a property or fail to keep it up. And was there a lot of support for this ordinance among the San Diego City Council members? Well, the registry ordinance pa passed the city council on a party line vote with the five Democrats supporting it and the four Republicans opposing it. Councilwoman Lori Zapp, a Republican, said the ordinance creates an expensive and somewhat unneeded bureaucracy because only a fraction of homes in default actually go into foreclosure and then only a fraction of those actually become blighted. But Democrats say it's a proactive measure that will make code enforcement easier. KPBS Metro reporter Katie Orr. Federal regulators are questioning part of the plan to restart the San Onofre nuclear power plant, and now the plant's operator is backing away from its claims about a, vi a vibration monitoring system. Southern California Edison had said the system could help detect a break in tubes carrying radioactive water in the plant's steam generators. But an official with the Nuclear Regulatory Commission says the monitor system doesn't work that way. Edison now says the system can collect data for future research. San Onofre has been shut down since January because of tube problems. Edison wants to restart one reactor at limited power. The NRC could decide by March whether or not to allow it. A public memorial will be held in Encinitas Thursday morning for Ravi Shankar, the sitar virtuoso who introduced Indian classical music to Western audiences. He died last week at the age of 92. There are an estimated 1.8 million female veterans in the United States right now. Roughly 25,000 of them live here in San Diego County. KPBS military reporter Beth Ford Roth says women leaving the service have unique needs and the Department of Veterans Affairs is working to keep up with those challenges. When veteran Tara Wise needs to let go of the stress of her hectic day, she heads to the Peace Palace in Encinitas to practice Transcendental Meditation, or TM. TM was able to help me realize that I, I'm, I will always be a woman veteran, so I embrace that, but also that I'm supposed to have challenges because of my active duty service. Wise, who is in her late 30s, served seven years in the Navy. It's a time in her life she doesn't like to talk about. Let's close her eyes. Wise was the victim of sexual abuse while in the military and has been diagnosed with military sexual trauma. She says the anguish she suffered in the military left her in a deep depression when she left the service. 
I was at a place when I just saw nothing but complete darkness and I was suffering from severe depression and I didn't know why. That's, that's the difficult part is not knowing what's going on with you. Wise says she was used to being part of a sisterhood in the military and didn't have that safety net when she rejoined the civilian world. The desire to recreate that female support network inspired Wise to start the National Women Veterans Association of America. I've, you know, really had challenges, all the challenges of being a woman veteran from uh, being a homeless woman veteran with, with a child. When I first got out of the military, I was, it was me and my son. My son was three years old. Um, and I just really struggled for looking for resources. And, but I was very adamant that I was not going to be one of the statistics. And those statistics are startling. According to the Government Accountability Office, the number of homeless female veterans in the United States rose 140 percent between 2006 and 2010. Why says the National Women Veterans Association of America works to help female veterans cut through red tape to find the resources that can help them stand on their own two feet. Yeah, that's perfect. Well, you, you try to tap into all the resources, and knowing what those resources are is the number one uh, challenge, uh, being able to access those resources. And because the, you know, veterans are government, there's so much bureaucracy. And so it's, you know, it's an overwhelming system and you just have to find your way through and, and um, look for doors that will open. You'll get a lot of doors that's closed, but look for doors that are open. And there's a very few, especially for women veterans, with specific interests into women veterans. Why says the Department of Veterans Affairs, or VA, needs to do a better job of providing health care that's unique to women who've served. The folks here at the VA in La Jolla say there are a variety of services for women many female veterans aren't aware of. Everything from mammograms to group therapy for survivors of military sexual trauma. It breaks my heart to have people say, I didn't know I could have come to the VA. I didn't know that these services were available to me. Debbie Dominic works at the VA in La Jolla. She says outreach is especially important for women veterans. Male veterans often learn about the services the VA provides from their fathers or brothers who were in the military. But women often don't have those same connections. Women make up nearly 12 percent of the veterans of the Iraq and Afghanistan wars. Dominic says the VA has to respond to this increase in women needing services. There's an observation that there are more women and that um, we need to be more cognizant of that and to provide women an opportunity to be together, women who have served to be together. This is especially true for women who have been diagnosed as suffering from military sexual trauma, like Tara Wise. According to the Department of Veterans Affairs, 20 percent of women who get their health care through the VA responded yes when screened for military sexual trauma. Dominic says the folks at the VA work hard to be sensitive to the needs of women diagnosed with MST. We make that very clear at, at the first appointment. Do you want to have somebody else to be in the room with you? Would you like an advocate? Is there a staff member that can, stand, can step in? We actually, every time we're meeting a veteran or seeing a veteran, we, we ask that question. Female veterans who want to find out more about the services available to them through the VA can stop by any VA hospital or go to the Department of Veterans Affairs website. Beth Ford Roth, KPBS News. San Diego County Registrar of Voters Deborah Seiler will retire two days after Christmas. Peggy Pico talks with her about what she's accomplished and the future of the registrar. After wrapping up a strenuous four-week process, certifying November's ballots and serving five years as the county's registrar of voters, my guest Deborah Seiler is retiring from her position and heading home to Sacramento. Deborah, thanks so much for joining us this one final time. You're welcome. Uh, when you first took the job back in 2007, there was some concern over your previous employment over these electronic voting machines. How did you overcome that uh, challenge? Well, that was pretty short-lived, actually. Um, I think that, you know, I, I did come directly from Solano County. I had not worked for the, in the voting industry for several years prior to coming here. Uh, but people seemed to want to talk about that, and that was fine. And, and I think that really it was just that once people got to know me, once they came to understand that I was uh, committed to the elections process and to the fair uh, processing and counting of all the votes, that they, um, they let that, that go. 
And there was a lot going on around voting machines at the time. In fact, California um, opted out of voting machines except for uh, the disabled. What's your take on it now? Is it relevant? Do, will we still use them? Well, it's probably a moot point at this at this stage because um, the Secretary of State has has said that we can only use one of the voting machines in every polling place, and those are still used by a lot of elderly people like them, disabled people, because the print is easy to read, it's easy to mark them. Um, you can blow up the type if you need larger type, and and of course for the visually impaired or blind, there's a headset, uh, there's an audio component to those machines. So they they serve a very useful purpose, and people still like them to some extent, but most people vote the paper ballots. One of the most prominent changes during your tenure here has been the expansive uh, growth of mail-in votes. Uh, what do you think about that? Do you like it? Well, we have more than doubled the number, well more than doubled the number of people who vote now by mail, and people find it so convenient. They, um, I, almost everybody I talk to votes by mail. In fact, for the very first time in a presidential general election, this last November election, we had more voters vote by mail than at the polls. And that's typical for other, for other elections, of course, that more people vote by mail, but not in a presidential general, which is such a high turnout. So this is very significant. And the good thing about it is that one minute after the polls closed, we released 33 percent of the entire vote cast in the whole election. So we have a, a lot of results to release right when the polls close. Of course, the counting process is a little bit slow uh, with the, the, the paper ballots, you know, that we have to scan. Um, but we've, we have gotten so that we're better and better at doing that, and we finished up by about 2.30 in the morning, which wasn't bad. Around the clock, I understand, for people who were there. Uh, seven, I just wanted to clarify, so about more than 700,000 in San Diego County uh, voted by mail? Uh, yes, we had uh, yes we had about seven hundred thousand uh, uh, mail ballots cast in this election. All right, your successor Michael Vu uh, served as registrar for the uh, I don't want to mess this up here Cuyahoga County in Ohio. Uh, what can you tell us about him? Well, Michael is a, a wonderfully bright, energetic young man. He's got a wealth of experience in elections. He has been an invaluable assistant registrar for these past five years. He came shortly before I did. And um, I, I know that he's going to bring his, his uh, huge talent uh, to serve the county very, very well. Okay, and you, you pretty similar on uh, you, your views are pretty similar. You believe as far as uh, how to operate the systems and all of that. Well, I think we've been we've been very compatible. It's been a nice working relationship, and I know that uh, Michael will probably uh, bring new ideas as new technologies emerge and and so forth. He's very technically uh, astute, and uh, but I know that he also appreciates how we've stabilized the operations and some of the changes that we've made together. And you've made quite a few changes. One of the last official events is Wednesday's groundbreaking of the uh, new $75 million registrar's facility. Uh, are you going to come back to see it? Oh, you bet I will. I'm so excited about this. I think this is just going to be absolutely thrilling, not only for the for the staff, but for the public. And and the building is part of the county operations center. They were able to acquire a piece of property right adjacent to that um, to that uh, current facility, and so that's where our new building is going to be, and it's really going to be wonderful to be part of the whole county operations as opposed to an isolated office. Well, you'll have to come back and see it, like you say, when it's all said and done. What plans do you have? 34 years of work, you're now retiring. Uh, you have a couple of goals uh, in your retirement. Well, I do, and I, I think maybe people think it's a little bit odd, but I really would like to visit all 58 county uh, registrar's offices, election offices in the state. The California is a fabulous state, and just to travel around and visit my colleagues and say hello, um, visit with them one last time is just something I aspire to do. Oh, I hope you get to. We are out of time at San Diego County Registrar of Voters, Deborah Seiler. Thanks again for talking with us, and the best to you in your retirement. Thank you so much. I'm Judy Woodruff on the next news hour. West Virginia Senator Joe Manchin, a defender of gun rights, who has called for a new dialogue on regulations. That's Tuesday on the PBS News Hour. And the Weather Service says that we should be able to put the umbrellas away tomorrow. That'll be a nice break for us. We have clouds, but no rain in the forecast for the coastal region. Sunshine is expected with some partly cloudy skies later in the week. Sunny days are also in the forecast for the mountains, and it's going to be a partly cloudy condition in the desert regions. Some San Diego families got a special delivery today. Lots of toys and the makings of a holiday feast. 
The San Diego and Imperial County's Labor Council teamed with the United Way, braving the rainy weather to help those affected by unemployment and underemployment. There was some good news. The Labor Council says demand is actually down a bit this year. So it's a good indication that our economy is coming back, but we still have um, a real big problem with underemployment. So people who are working part time and working low wage jobs. And so we're seeing more and more people who, although they have a job, it's not enough to provide, um, you know, just a little bit more during the Christmas season. About 500 families received toys and food today at that giveaway. Remember, we've got tonight's stories and more news on our website, kpbs.org slash evening edition. Thanks for joining us and have a great evening.